The SuperPath hip technique was developed as an alternative to traditional total hip replacement. The SuperPath hip technique is a tissue sparing approach intended to get patients back on their feet within days instead of weeks or months. Patients who have undergone this operation are generally able to walk unassisted or with single-sided support on day one. In addition, a study by Dr. James Chow has demonstrated that the average SuperPath patient leaves the hospital less than two days after surgery and without the typical movement restrictions associated with total hip arthroplasty. The most common posterior approach is referred to as the posterior lateral approach. With this technique, surgeons historically have been trained to incise several muscle structures as well as release the short external rotators. In the past, the posterior approach also reported dislocation rates that led surgeons to investigate new and improved surgical techniques to lower these rates while shortening the recovery time. The direct anterior approach was designed to allow surgeons to gain access to the hip without cutting the gluteus medius muscle. Although theoretically advantageous, this does present significant constraints because of the more limited working space. Special training and experience are required to minimize the risk of nerve injury, muscle or tendon injury, wound problems, fracture, limb length discrepancy, and dislocation. Although this approach to the hip can be accomplished without cutting a single tendon, there are several published reports indicating that the procedure often requires the release of the posterior hip capsule and one or more of the tendons at the back of the hip. The supercapsular percutaneously assisted total hip or superpath arthroplasty is a patented approach that allows the femur to be prepared in situ and does not require dislocation of the hip. Unlike the direct anterior approach, the superpath technique is also extensile and capitalizes on a surgeon's familiarity with the posterior approach, maintaining a better comfort level and allowing a phased approach to master the technique. By avoiding the traditional sacrifice of four to five tendons around the hip, there is less trauma, less pain, less bleeding, and more intact tissue, specifically the short external rotator tendons. In addition, preparation of the femur with the femoral neck intact discourages the chance of fracture associated with non-cemented femoral components and permits precise resection of the neck. The key to any successful tissue sparing approach is the reduction in trauma incurred by the soft tissue structures around the hip. The SuperPath hip technique offers a tissue sparing approach that does not require the resection of any muscles and releases the piriformis tendon only when patient anatomy demands, which is repaired at the end of the procedure. The patient is secured in a lateral decubitus position on the operating table, preferably with the use of a pegboard and radiolucent pegs to permit a good quality intraoperative x-ray. With the pelvis leaning slightly posterior, flex the operative hip 45 degrees and internally rotate the operative leg 10 to 15 degrees to orient the greater trochanter upward. Resting the operative foot on a padded mayo stand with the leg in slight adduction, the weight of the operative leg will bring the pelvis to the balanced neutral rotation. This is the home position of the technique as the operative leg will remain there for most of the procedure. The incision is initiated at the posterior corner of the tip of the greater trochanter and extends six to eight centimeters proximal in line with the femoral axis. The incision is carried down to the fascia overlying the gluteus maximus. The fascia is then incised using electrocautery in line with the main incision and a pair of wing-tipped elevators may be used to longitudinally separate the muscle fibers with minimal trauma exposing the bursa tissue along the posterior border of the gluteus medius. After careful incision of a very thin layer of the bursa tissue, a cob elevator is placed under the gluteus medius. The cob elevator is then replaced with a blunt Hohmann retractor, using gentle pressure to maintain the position in the interval between the gluteus medius and the gluteus minimus. With the hip abducted and externally rotated, a cob elevator is placed between the piriformis tendon and the gluteus minimus. The cob elevator is then replaced with a blunt Hohmann retractor and the knee is lowered to return the leg to the home position. Gentle pressure is used to maintain the retractor's position between the posterior capsule and the external rotators. 
Should the piriformis tendon create excessive force against the retractor, it is then released at this time under direct visualization. A cob elevator is used to move the gluteus minimus anteriorly and expose the capsule. The capsule is then incised in line with the main incision using electrocautery. Electrocautery with a long tip should be used to incise in the trochanteric fossa to prevent bleeding around the base of the femoral neck. The capsulotomy is extended from the saddle of the femoral neck to one centimeter proximally over the acetabulum. The capsular attachment should be carefully peeled off the acetabular rim, extending one centimeter anteriorly and posteriorly. With the knee lifted to reduce external rotator tension, a cob elevator is placed between the posterior capsule and the posterior femoral neck. The cob elevator is then replaced with the blunt Hohmann retractor that was previously located at the posterior capsule, and the knee is lowered to return the leg to the home position. The anterior blunt Hohmann is repositioned similarly, and the capsule is tagged for identification during repair. With gentle adduction pressure applied to the knee, the femur is prepared with the head intact. The femoral canal is entered through the trochanteric fossa using a starter reamer. A conical reamer is then used to expand and lateralize the proximal opening. Depending upon the size of the templated stem, the round calcar punches are used to create a slot for broaching, progressing from the original reamer opening toward the acetabular rim. The calcar curette is then introduced into the femur to prepare the proximal medial portion of the canal, making sure the surface provides good cortical contact to promote bone on growth while preventing subsidence and micromotion. The femoral canal is prepared according to the selected stem using either a ream and brooch or brooch only technique. After sequential broaching, the final brooch is left seated within the canal. With the knee lifted to place the leg in slight abduction, the femoral neck is resected across the top of the brooch. An oscillating saw is used to cut through the neck and a reciprocating saw is used to complete the cut anteriorly and posteriorly. A chance pin is placed in a solid portion of the femoral head and the head is rotated into maximum adduction. A second chance pin is then placed in the femoral head and rotated into maximum adduction until the ligamentum teres is either torn or can be severed using electrocautery. Using the two drill chucks as handles, the resected head is removed. With the operative leg returned to the original patient position, acetabular preparation begins. Two spiked homans are placed at the anterior and posterior sides of the acetabulum into the axilla between the capsule and the labrum. The labrum is removed as well as any remaining tissue from the acetabulum. A zelpi retractor is placed subperiosteally at the acetabular margin at the proximal wound and a Romanelli retractor is placed immediately distal. The combination of these retractors provides rotational stability and a surface on which to introduce reamers into the joint. The spiked Hohmann retractors are removed. The tip of the bone hook is inserted into the brooch to retract the femur anteriorly, and the alignment handle, portal placement guide, threaded cup adapter, and trial cup assembly are seated in the acetabulum. With the top of the alignment handle perpendicular to the patient's torso, and the shaft tilted 10 to 15 degrees from vertical to account for the pelvic tilt of the patient on the table, the blunt trocar with cannula is inserted until the tip is resting against the operative leg. At the point where the blunt trocar intersects the leg, a one centimeter stab wound is made horizontally. The blunt trocar and cannula are then passed through the stab wound and behind the femur until they are visible through the main incision. The alignment handle assembly and blunt trocar are then removed, leaving the cannula in place. Acetabular reaming is carried out with sequentially sized reamers positioned into the main incision using the reamer basket holder. The reamer shaft inserted through the cannula engages each of the reamer baskets by way of a hex-shaped connection. The threaded cup adapter is threaded into the apical hole of the acetabular cup and the assembly is seated on the alignment handle. With the acetabular cup in the acetabulum, the alignment handle is directly driven to medialize the cup. The cup impactor is inserted through the cannula and the tip of the alignment handle until seated in the dimple of the threaded cup adapter. The cup impactor is impacted until the cup is firmly seated. 
an alignment guide is available for attachment on the cup impactor. With the cup firmly seated, the threaded cup impactor is unscrewed from the acetabular cup using the hex tip of the cup impactor and removed using the reamer basket holder. Pilot holes for acetabular screws are created by inserting the drill tube through the cannula until it engages the screw hole. The screw drill is then passed through the long drill tube and, using the measurement markings on the end of the screw drill, drilling is carried out to the desired depth. Head and neck trials are selected by measuring the resected femoral head or by preoperative templating. The trial neck is seated into the femoral brooch, while the trial head is placed into the cup with the opening in a superior posterior position. With the tip of the blunt trocar inserted into the top of the brooch, the leg is translated to mate the trial neck into the trial head. Raising and lowering the foot of the operative leg assists in the maneuver. With the leg returned to the home position, the bone hook is inserted into the brooch and lateral traction is applied. The blunt trocar is inserted into the hole of the trial neck and the bone hook and blunt trocar are leveraged against each other to disassemble the trial neck from the brooch. After removing the brooch, the femoral stem and acetabular cup implants are impacted into position. The modular neck implant is then seated into the femoral stem and impacted firmly using the offset neck impactor. The femoral head implant is placed into the cup with the opening in a superior posterior position. With the tip of the blunt trocar inserted into the top of the stem, the leg is translated to mate the modular neck into the femoral head. Raising and lowering the foot of the operative leg again assists in this maneuver. Closure begins by approximating the joint capsule superiorly and inferiorly. If released, the piriformis is reattached to the posterior edge of the gluteus medius. The remainder of the incision is closed in standard fashion. Proper surgical procedures are the responsibility of the medical professional. The guidelines are furnished for informational purposes only. Each surgeon must evaluate the appropriateness of the procedure based on his or her personal medical training and experience. Prior to use of the system, the surgeon should refer to the product package insert and surgical technique for complete warnings, precautions, indications, contraindications, and adverse effects. Package inserts can be found under the link for prescribing information on Wright's website at WMT.com.